Gandhi. Not long after Gandhi's father died in 1885, he journeyed to South Africa. It was here where he first dabbled in activism, but it was also in South Africa where he spent a large part of his adulthood. He lived there from at least between 1893 and 1915, or from his middle twenties to his middle forties. This was way before he became the figurehead for India's independence. But what many people don't realize is that Gandhi was blatantly racist for a huge part of his life. While he was in South Africa, he fought for the rights of Indians living in South Africa because it was a British colony just like India, but not for the South Africans. In one of his speeches, he says that Indians are continuously struggling against the degradation inflicted upon them by the Europeans. He then says that the Europeans wish to degrade the Indians down to the level of the native Africans, and basically calls them primitive. In Gandhi's address in Bombay in 1896, he says Africans' only occupation is hunting, and their only ambition is to collect enough cattle to buy a wife, and then pass the rest of their life being lazy and naked. He even called African people uncivilized and troublesome, and compared them to animals, and this was in 1908. So while Gandhi dedicated much of his life to helping the Indian people, he didn't exactly care for other people with dark skin. Mother Teresa In 2016, Mother Teresa was declared a saint by Pope Francis. But not everyone is convinced. The problem with Mother Teresa being a saint is that, in order to achieve sainthood, the Vatican has to legitimately recognize two very real miracles that occurred during the person's life. These miracles need to be something that only a godly person could have done, like cure someone of an incurable disease or walk on water. And since we have science, proving miracles isn't exactly that easy. With Mother Teresa's miracles, the first was recognized in 2003 by John Paul II, and the second was recognized by Pope Francis in 2015. Both popes claimed that Mother Teresa cured a woman and a man of their tumors, but these cases have been seriously disputed, especially since the doctor who worked on one case had actually been the one to treat the tumor with drugs. This doctor has been quite vocal about the absence of any miracle, other than the miracle of science. There were also many critics of the medical centers that she started. Sometimes the conditions were so bad, patients would get even sicker. There was a documentary showing expired medications, needles washed under tap water and then reused, volunteers with no training helping people with highly contagious diseases. Mother Teresa believed that patients only needed to feel loved by God and die in peace, not necessarily receive proper medical care. So medical experts were not very happy with this. They called them homes for the dying instead of homes for the sick. She may have spent her life as a humanitarian, but she wasn't exactly the humanitarian we look up to these days. Her main purpose was to convert as many people to Catholicism as she could. This often came at the expense of the poor and the sick. Even the New York Times said in their paper that Mother Teresa was less interested in helping the poor and more interested in using them to fuel the expansion of her fundamentalist Roman Catholic beliefs. She also rubbed elbows with many wealthy elite friends, such as Haitian dictator Jean-Claude Duvalier, who was eventually charged with crimes against humanity, and Charles Keating, who was one of the key figures that brought about a housing and loan crisis in the 80s. There is also the question of the money. Mother Teresa received millions, but she would never buy anything and only had her organizations live off donations. So where did all that money go? Nobody knows. Abe Lincoln There are some people who say Abraham Lincoln was about as racist as a man could get. He believed slavery was morally wrong, but that had nothing to do with his view of the slaves themselves. In 1858, when Abraham Lincoln defeated Stephen Douglas, Lincoln made his opinion very clear. He said that he was not in favor of bringing about any social and political equality between white and black people. He even said that he opposed black people having the right to vote or to intermarry with whites. That being said, Abraham Lincoln believed all men had the right to improve their position in society, and because of that, slavery, Lincoln felt, 
was totally unjust. Here's another thing many people don't know about Lincoln. He was a tremendous supporter of colonization and may have believed that if the entire continent of Africa were colonized by United States citizens, the problem of slavery would just vanish. In 1854, he openly advocated for colonization and said his first decree would be to free all slaves in America and ship them to Liberia. Liberia actually began as an African state founded by the American Colonization Society in 1821. Lincoln even hosted a delegation in 1862 of recently freed men and women to discuss a plan for the colonization of Central America. He argued it would be better to turn Central America into one big U.S. colony where many freed slaves could be sent. In his own words, it would be better for everyone. Nikola Tesla Nikola Tesla was one of the greatest inventors in human history, and yet he was also one of the most disturbed. Tesla had all kinds of strange ideas about how the world should operate, and even had plans on how to put those ideas into motion. For example, Tesla said in the 1930s that criminals should be forcibly sterilized, and so should the mentally ill. He even said that places like Nazi Germany and the US weren't going far enough with their treatment of criminals and the less desirable members of society. It was his humble opinion that by the year 2100, eugenics would be a universally established system to weed out undesirable humans from the greater population. Nikola Tesla believed in some of the same things Hitler did. He wanted to use sterilization and extermination to purify the human race. He said that in the past, those who survived were always the fittest. But because of man's newly discovered sense of pity, the unfit continue to be bred when they should be restricted from having children. He also suggested making marriage impossible for criminals. Einstein In the 1980s, Evan Walker Harris published an article in Physics Today. The American physicist suggested in his article that Einstein was not the genius we believe him to be. He said that Einstein's first wife, Maleva Marek, was the silent co-author of his paper on special relativity in 1905. He insists Einstein couldn't figure it out on his own and needed help from his wife, and then he never acknowledged that she had helped and went on to later divorce her. He may have stolen his wife's idea, then ghosted her. This paper was immediately rejected by most historians and physicists. Galina Weinstein at the Center for Einstein Studies at Boston University is a staunch believer in Einstein's genius. She says that based on letters written by both Einstein and his first wife, they didn't work together on anything relating to physics. Instead, Maleva Marek was more like a confidant who Einstein talked to and bounced ideas off of. We don't know which story is true, but there appears to be something strange going on. Einstein was definitely a very brilliant physicist, but we have to wonder if he was a genius all on his own or had some help from his first wife, Thomas Watson. Thomas Watson was not quite as famous as the other people we talked about today, but he was one of the first great businessmen in the USA. He was born in 1874 in New York, had his first job selling pianos and sewing machines door to door, and worked his way up to the top. He eventually became the general manager of the Computing Tabulating Recording Company. This was a business that dealt with things like time clocks and punch cards. They also dealt with new technology that could weigh food and calculate the price. This was very cutting-edge stuff back in the early 1900s. In 1924, Thomas Watson had taken over the company. He renamed it International Business Machines, or IBM. He was like the original Steve Jobs, just without personally inventing the technology. Still, his company flourished. It easily survived the great stock market crash of 1929. It made profits during the Depression, and Watson agreed to make digital calculating machines in 1938, which would become desktop computers. But here comes the dark side. During World War II, Thomas Watson doubled IBM's employees to about 22,000 people. They worked extremely hard to provide war materials to the United States. IBM was the only company in the world that could make computation machines capable of aiding the military in complicated logistic decisions. But they were also supplying these same crucial computation machines to the enemy. 
Thomas Watson was directly responsible for supplying Nazi Germany with some of the technology they needed to wage war. While most companies immediately pulled out of Germany once the war started, IBM stuck around to make a huge profit. It was with Watson's technology that the Nazis transported millions of people to their deaths in concentration camps throughout Europe. Aristotle Aristotle was allegedly a great thinker. He more or less was alive at the right time to record his thoughts on politics and metaphysics and for people to remember him. Aristotle was a curious man with some pretty bad ideas. He loved physics, chemistry, the study of the stars and even biology. One thing he hated was women. Aristotle made some really odd claims about women during his life. He said women have fewer teeth than men. He also said that when compared to men, women are immature, deformed, and even monstrous. He even believed men had hotter blood than women for some strange reason. Although Aristotle wasn't as awful as Plato, the great philosopher who believed all women should be communally shared. Aristotle's bad ideas kept going on and on. You have to remember that back when he was alive in the 4th century BC, the entire city of Athens was basically run by slaves. Aristotle once wrote that prisoners of war certainly don't believe in being enslaved just because they were on the losing side of the battle. But he also argued that some people were naturally born to be slaves. But it wasn't a race issue, it was a brain issue. Aristotle said that anyone who willingly submits and takes orders and anyone not smart enough to think for themselves should just be a slave and leave the thinking to more advanced men. He called these machine people no better than animals. Oliver Cromwell In the United Kingdom, Oliver Cromwell is somewhat comparable to Abraham Lincoln in the US with fame and reverence. The BBC did a poll asking citizens who the greatest Britain of the second millennium was, and Oliver Cromwell came in third. And in the 150 biographies that have been published over the past 100 years, Cromwell is almost always shown in a favorable light. Oliver Cromwell, who died 350 years ago, was not a revolutionary hero. He was a war criminal guilty of religious persecution and ethnic cleansing. He conducted two massacres in Ireland. The slaughter at Drogheda and Wexford in 1649 was one of the greatest atrocities in history. Cromwell was an English general who led the armies of the Parliament of England in the English Civil War. He then ruled the British Isles as Lord Protector between 1653 and 1658. Basically, he was the unofficial King and Lord of the British Isles. The one good thing he did was pull England out of a period of darkness and stabilize the government. Many consider him both a revolutionary and a bloodthirsty dictator. One of the biggest things about Cromwell was that he hated Irish Catholics. When he went to Ireland, he had a mission to wipe out as many of the Irish Catholics as he could. By the time he was finished with Ireland, after a great ethnic cleansing and tens of thousands slaughtered, the country was ruled by the Protestants. Walt Disney Walt Disney was born in the year 1901, the second year of the 20th century. Over the next 65 years, he grew to be a business tycoon and a huge name in the film industry. But Disney wasn't as benevolent as his image would make him appear. In 1928, Walt Disney sketched a mouse, the very mouse that would become the face of Disney. Its name was Mortimer Mouse. Imagine how different things would have been if Disney had actually named the mouse Mortimer instead of Mickey. It wasn't until he showed the sketch to his wife that she could talk him out of it. His wife Lily said Mortimer was too pompous of a name and that Mickey was cuter. While Disney was a pioneering and prosperous man, he was also the subject of many controversies, some of which involved rumors that he was anti-Semitic and racist. These rumors were and remain hard to dismiss. In the 1930s, Disney went to meetings of a pro-Nazi organization, the German-American Bund. He also invited a known Nazi propagandist and filmmaker, Leni Riefenstahl, and gave her a personal tour of Disney Studios. Disney was also accused of spreading black stereotypes in his films. Even though he had many critics, Disney also had numerous supporters who said he was not anti-Semitic or racist. The argument about Disney's suspected discrimination and racism continues to this day. Che Guevara 
Che Guevara's face is everywhere these days, even though quite a few people don't even know his name. The iconic Argentine Marxist and revolutionary is a big deal to socialists and was definitely one of the most influential humans at the end of the 20th century. The picture you see of him on the t-shirts is considered one of the most famous photographs in the entire world. In 1954, he met Fidel Castro in Mexico and joined his rebellion in Cuba. Fidel won the rebellion and became the president of Cuba, and together with Che, declared Cuba a communist country. Then, in 1965, Che began more revolutions in places like Congo, Kinshasa, and Bolivia. But just two years later, in 1967, he was captured and killed by Bolivian soldiers. Most people make Che Guevara out to be a kind of anti-hero, a great revolutionary who helped liberate Cuba. But he was actually a very evil person. Perhaps the evilest thing about him was that he really enjoyed killing. He was once quoted as saying that murdering another person made his nostrils dilate and that he savored the smell of gunpowder and blood. He became angry when the Soviet Union refused to attack America and claimed if the Cubans had received those missiles, they definitely would have used them. He did some other pretty nasty stuff. He created the first ever correction work camp in Cuba, which was the Cuban version of a Soviet gulag. Under Guevara's reign, anyone who was anti-authority was taken and tortured. Many people were killed and mutilated, and an unknown number of people were executed on Shea's direct orders, often by his own hand, because he supposedly loved doing it. Rasputin In the early 1900s, Grigory Rasputin was the mystical advisor to Tsar Nicholas II of Russia. During those years, no other political figure was so mysterious or controversial. Even these days, there are rumors that he rose from the dead and that he was impossible to kill. Some people even believe that he he truly had some kind of magical powers. They called him the Mad Monk, and his rise from peasant to the royal court of Russia is still a story for the ages. But how did he do it? Rasputin was born in 1869 in a tiny village in Siberia. He drank a lot, and he was a known womanizer. He also made his money through petty thievery. As he grew into a young man, his desire for more in life led him to abandon his family, and he set off in search of spiritual wisdom. He studied with monks, but not just any monks. He joined an offshoot of the Russian Orthodox religious group who believed that the only way to reach God was through sinful activity. This resulted in Rasputin becoming even more of a deviant, allegedly sleeping with hundreds of women, even though people claimed he smelled like a goat. Then came Alexandra Fedorovna, a firm believer in the occult and the wife of Tsar Nicholas. When her only son Alexei began to suffer from hemophilia, she went in search of a healer, and that was when she found Rasputin. However, he was technically introduced to Nicholas prior to that, in early November of 1905. But when he met Alexandra, she became convinced of his mystical powers, and he earned himself a seat of great importance within the royal court. You can almost think of Rasputin like Jafar from Aladdin. He was the evil advisor to the king and whispered decisions in his ear. But alas, Rasputin was seen as a dangerous menace by the other Russian elites. And on December 20th, 1916, Rasputin was shot to death by assassins. Louis XIV Louis XIV is a perfect example of what happens when a man is given absolute power and nobody ever tells him no. Louis is a well-known ruler. In fact, he's one of the best-remembered kings of Europe. He built the Palace of Versailles and created a lasting monarchy in France. But he lived during a time when people in Europe had some very weird beliefs, and he was just as strange. Louis XIV was born in 1638, and he became king at the young age of five. Because of this, he grew up believing that he was essentially a god among men. He was so bizarre that male courtiers who sat at his dinner table had to do so by following three specific steps. They had to slide their left foot in front of their right foot, place their hands on the sides of their chair, and then gently lower themselves down. This absolutely had to be done, or the courtier was not allowed to sit with the king. He had other strange rules as well. For example, nobody was ever allowed to knock on his door. Instead, they had to lightly scratch the door with their pinky finger. 
Louis XIV was also a filthy man. In the 17th century, physicians believed that bathing opened up pores so that disease could pour into the human body. People were generally warned to avoid washing at all costs. Historical accounts claim Louis XIV only bathed three times in his whole life. Instead, he changed his linens three times a day to keep himself as clean as possible. Anne Green Anne Green was born in England sometime around the year 1628. By all accounts, she was a poor woman who worked as a scullery maid in the house of Sir Thomas Reed. Little is known about her early life, but we know a lot about Anne's death. After she was found guilty of infanticide in 1650, she was hanged, but shockingly, she survived her execution. It was such a miraculous occurrence that many believed she had supernatural powers. Anne Green was 22 years old when she worked as a maid for Thomas. She claimed that the man's grandson, who was only 16, seduced her and got her pregnant. However, she would later miscarry while sitting on the toilet and she tried to conceal the remains. But she was found out and Sir Thomas had her prosecuted under the Concealment of Birth of Bastards Act, which was a very real act put in place in 1624. On behalf of the miscarried infant, Anne was sentenced to death for murder. On December 14th, she was hanged at Oxford Castle. But the hanging didn't go very well. Several of her friends pulled her body down so the rope could strangle her while a soldier hit her in the head with his musket. After 30 minutes of this brutality, she was cut down and handed over to physicians at the University of Oxford for dissection. The next day, the physicians opened her coffin and found Anne alive. They nursed her back to health, and after a month she was perfectly fine except for a bit of amnesia. It was believed that she was saved by the hand of God and was forgiven for the murder charge. Comte de Saint-Germain Comte de Saint-Germain, or the Count of Saint-Germain, was an alchemist who allegedly discovered the secret for immortality. Historical records date his birth to the late 1600s, although rumor has it that he was born closer to the time of Christ. He supposedly appeared multiple times throughout history, even in the 1970s. Each time he crops up, he always looks like he's about 45 years old. He was known by many famous European figures, such as Voltaire, Catherine the Great, and King Louis XV. But this man is the source of much controversy and speculation. The official Saint-Germain, the man who definitely existed, first appeared in records in European high society in 1742. He was a mystical scientist who could supposedly control the elements. He spent five years in Persia studying the jeweler's craft, and he delighted kings and queens with his extensive knowledge of history. He could even speak at least a dozen languages. He was so extraordinary that he soon became friends with all the top nobles of Europe. Then in Paris in 1760, Countess von Georgie heard that a man named Comte de Saint-Germain had arrived at the home of one of King Louis XV's mistresses. The elderly countess was interested because she'd met someone by the same name in Venice in 1710. When she laid eyes upon him again, she was shocked to see that he hadn't aged in 50 years. We don't know what happened to Saint-Germain, or if he really was immortal, and it's a mystery as to how he keeps appearing randomly throughout history. The only thing that's for certain is that he took Europe by storm in the 1700s with his exceptional wisdom and personality. King Tutankhamun King Tutankhamun is one of the most famous Egyptian pharaohs that we know about, and yet his time on the throne was short-lived. He became the king of Egypt in 1332 BC at the ripe young age of nine, and he ruled at a time when battles raged over much of the region. Then, less than a decade after he came into power, King Tut died at 18 years old. We knew almost nothing about him until British archaeologist Howard Carter discovered his treasure-filled tomb in 1922. A century later, we still don't know all of King Tut's secrets. For example, we aren't sure exactly how he was killed. Some say he was murdered, possibly by poison, but nobody is certain. Modern 3D scans have shown that the powerful king was in very poor health at the time of his death, and maybe even suffered from a broken leg. Some experts have guessed that he could have tumbled out of his chair Harriet then died from an infection caused by one of his wounds. If that were true, it would be the ancient Egyptian equivalent of a modern king dying in a car accident. Do you think King Tut really died after falling out of his chariot? Or do you think he could have been assassinated? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And while you're at it, hit that subscribe button. Eleanor of Aquitaine 
Eleanor of Aquitaine was a mysterious yet mighty woman who lived in the Middle Ages and ruled two nations. She was a mother to kings and she led one of the Crusades. She also played politics in France and England. No woman in medieval Europe stands out quite as much as Eleanor, who was once the most eligible bachelorette in the world. Eleanor was born sometime around 1124 in southwest France. After her brother died in 1130 and her father passed away in April of 1137, she she was left as the heiress to her father's dominions in Aquitaine and beyond. She was married to the future Louis VII of France in 1137, and seven days later she was named queen. She gave birth to two daughters, and then in 1147 she departed for the Holy Land to help fight the Second Crusade with her husband. However, this decision was an utter disaster, and Eleanor, feeling defeated, sailed back to France in 1149. Her marriage to Louis was declared void in 1152, and a couple of years later she married Henry II, making her the Queen of England. Over the course of their marriage, Eleanor bore Henry eight children, three daughters, and five sons. Eleanor continued to be a force of nature up into her 70s, something that was practically unheard of in the Middle Ages. One of her sons, Richard the Lionheart, grew up to be King of England, and in 1204 she passed away when she was around 80 years old. Witch Elm Bella Four young boys in England went out into the forest to look for bird eggs at the height of the Second World War. They didn't find any eggs, but what they discovered instead was a human skull hidden in the hollow trunk of a witch elm. They alerted the authorities, who found the entire skeleton stuffed inside the hollow tree. The pathologist who did the investigation determined that the skeleton belonged to a woman who'd been dead for about 18 months. The police initially thought it would be an easy investigation. Abnormalities with the woman's jaw suggested they would be able to find her identity through dental records, but that didn't lead to anything. Then anthropologist Professor Margaret Murray came forward to say the woman bore all the signs of a black magic execution. Being buried inside of a tree is part of a belief that the victim will be unable to haunt whoever murdered them. Then things got even stranger when graffiti began to appear in different parts of England. The graffiti said, who put Bella down the witch elm? To this day, the mystery has never been solved. Some have speculated the victim was a German spy, but those accusations have never been confirmed. The creepy graffiti continued all the way until 1999, and while modern DNA tests might be able to solve the mystery of who Bella was and why she was in the tree, the skeleton has since vanished without a trace. Charles XII over 300 years ago in 1718, King Charles XII of Sweden was shot to death in a battle that took place in Norway. Ever since he passed away, people have wondered who killed him. We don't know if it was an enemy bullet that killed the king or if he was assassinated by a friend. However, a group of Finnish researchers recently claimed to have solved the mystery. The king was trying to take the Danish fortress of Fredrikstad when he died from a gunshot wound to the head. The researchers from Finland decided to finally solve the mystery by test firing different kinds of ammunition and comparing the wounds to the gaping hole in Charles's mummified skull. According to their tests, they concluded that Charles was killed by an iron bullet. Based on a hole in his skull, the bullet was traveling at about 656 feet per second. This suggests that the bullet came from the enemy fortress, not from one of his own soldiers acting as a secret assassin. The Magi Apparently, Christmas doesn't end on December 25th. The truth is that in Christian traditions, there are 12 days of Christmas which culminate on January the 6th. This day is called the Feast of the Epiphany, the day the Three Wise Men, also called the Three Wise Kings or the Three Magi, first beheld the newborn baby Jesus. But were the Three Wise Men truly historical figures, or were they just made-up characters in an ancient story? The truth is that the three wise men only appear in chapter 2 of the Gospel of Matthew, and we don't even know if there were three of them. It simply says, some men from the east, leaving the number of wise men up for interpretation. These men saw a star appear in the east, and somehow knew that a baby had just been born that would eventually grow up to be the king of the Jews. 
They followed the star to the location of Jesus and Mary, and they showered the holy baby with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Kristen Swenson from the Virginia Commonwealth University is an expert in religious studies. She says the Gospel of Matthew reimagines a much older prophecy written in the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. This older prophecy says that one day nations will recognize Israel as the light of the world, and they'll shower the country with gifts. What gifts, you might ask? Gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We don't know who the three wise men were, but many religious scholars don't even think they were real to begin with. King Henry IV. King Henry IV of France reigned from 1589 to 1610. He was raised Protestant thanks to his mother, at a time when most French people were Catholic and uninterested in being ruled by a Protestant. France had been fighting wars for the past few years between Catholics and Protestants, and everyone was ready for a single religion. But they didn't think that Henry was the answer. In 1598, Henry enraged the majority of the population by imposing a law that allowed people to be Protestant if they wanted to. It was surprisingly progressive because he was giving people the choice, whereas most policies in Europe forced people to be either one or the other. Henry was a hated man by most sides, and so it was no surprise when he was murdered by a Catholic extremist on the streets of Paris on May 14, 1610. But this wasn't the only attempt on his life. King Henry miraculously survived over 20 assassination attempts throughout his time on the throne. Although he was largely disliked during his rule, he took on the nickname Good King Henry after his death. He ended up becoming one of the most beloved kings in French history. On a side note, his head was stolen from his crypt in 1793, and then it was supposedly stashed in a bank vault somewhere in Paris. Peter Nears Peter Nears was one of the most horrifying people that ever lived. He allegedly slaughtered 544 people, including 24 pregnant women. It's said that he was a master of black magic and had all kinds of bizarre powers. Supposedly, he could turn himself invisible in the blink of an eye and could even transform into a cat or a goat. It's believed he garnered these strange powers by eating his victims and carrying around a leather pouch filled with hands and feet. Peter was born as a peasant in 16th century Germany. It was a time of war that undoubtedly played a role in who he became. After the peasant uprising of 1525, known in the history books as the German Peasants' War and the precursor to the French Revolution, the country was in chaos. Crime rates soared, people were murdering each other left and right, and Germany was awash in anarchy from between 1570 to 1590, give or take a few years. It was during all this violence that Peter began to feed his darkest desires. He started out by robbing people and soon became the leader of 24 bandits who terrorized the European countryside for roughly 11 years. They killed, stole, and even massacred rival gangs. They even marched into villages and towns and would attack law-abiding citizens for their goods and gold. Peter and his bandits were captured in 1577 and tortured, at which point he confessed to at least 75 murders. Some of these explained local women who had mysteriously disappeared. Somehow he managed to escape imprisonment and continue on with his sinister ways until 1581. By this time, Peter was well known across the country. One night he stayed at a local inn, and the innkeeper came into his room while he was taking a bath. They discovered his leather pouch full of body parts and knew exactly who he was. The innkeeper quickly alerted the authorities, and Peter was captured again. It's believed he was arrested so easily because he was separated from his magical objects, which were believed to make him invisible. On the first day of his imprisonment, he had parts of his flesh skinned off, and then hot oil was poured into the wounds. The second day, his feet were greased and shoved into burning coals in an attempt to burn him alive. On the third day, Peter was strapped to the breaking wheel, the infamous torture device designed to break bones and crush someone to death. Although he endured all this torture, he survived. Some believe he was protected by some deal with the devil. However, he finally died after the executioner chopped off all his limbs. Turns out the demented black magician wasn't immortal after all. The Imperial Poisoner Locusta of Gaul was one of the very first serial killers in the world. 
She was born in the countryside of Gaul in the first century, during the Roman Empire. She learned to use herbs and natural ingredients to create poisons, and began her career selling those poisons to people in the city who wanted to assassinate their enemies. She was basically an arms dealer, selling her toxins to people who openly wished to commit murder. It was around the year 54 AD when she was finally picked up by Roman authorities and imprisoned. They realized she was behind multiple deaths, albeit not technically by her own hand. She merely supplied the weapons used in the killings. But before she could be put to death, Empress Agrippina the Younger decided to take Locusta into her service. She wanted to murder her husband Claudius, thereby ensuring that her son Nero would inherit the throne. And yes, this is the infamous Nero who would go on to be one of the worst emperors in Roman history. First, Locusta supplied a poison intended to upset the stomach of Claudius's guard and personal food taster. Once he was out of the way, she would be able to poison Claudius's favorite food, a mushroom dish which he did not hesitate to eat. However, Claudius was a clever man. He always had a feather on hand. Just in case he suspected poison, he could use the feather to tickle the back of his throat and make himself vomit. But his plan failed because Locusta also poisoned the feather. Once he was dead and Nero was on the throne, he recruited Locusta to be his personal assassin. She was used to kill his own brother Britannicus, then kept on as the imperial poisoner. Nero granted his favorite assassin large estates. She became wealthy, and we don't actually know how many people she killed. After Nero died in 68 AD, many of Nero's personal cronies were sentenced to death by Emperor Galba, who succeeded him. One of those executed was the queen of poison, Locusta, Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper was behind what is now known as the Autumn of Terror in 1888. In Whitechapel, London, five women were officially victimized by the Ripper. They are known as the Canonical Five and include Mary Ann Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes, and Mary Jane Kelly. Each of these women was killed within a mile of the other, and their bodies were all mutilated in surgical and bizarre ways. Many of their internal organs had been removed as well, including their uteruses or kidneys. The London police believed that their killer had a learned knowledge of human anatomy. The women the Ripper targeted were mostly working girls, London prostitutes who skulked the streets at night looking for customers. But while they were skulking the streets, so too was Jack the Ripper. And although we know for sure that he killed five women, at least six other murders have been linked to him as well. One of them was the murder of Martha Tabram, found dead on August 7, 1888. She had been stabbed 39 times with two different knives, one of which might have been a bayonet, leading authorities to believe that the killer was most likely a soldier or a sailor. One of the things that made Jack so hard to find was that although his victims had all been butchered, each one was killed in a different way. Take the night of September 30th, when both Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes were killed. The woman had been killed by cuts to their throats, but Elizabeth hadn't been disemboweled. She had merely been murdered and left in the gutter. It was almost like Jack was already bored from brutalizing his first victim, but more likely he was interrupted. At the end of his spree in 1888, he never killed again that we know of. He came and went like a ghost, and over a hundred years later, we still don't know his real identity. Ranavalona the Cruel Ranavalona the Cruel was born in 1788 in Madagascar. This is a large island off the coast of Africa in the Indian Ocean, described as a paradise on Earth. It's one of the most diverse ecosystems in the world, and was once home to one of the most brutal queens in history. Ranavalona the Cruel declared herself queen in 1829. She killed all her rivals, including Prince Rakatobe, and she locked his mother in a cell and starved her to death. And this was only the beginning of her terror. The first thing she did was expel all the Europeans from Madagascar. She got rid of the merchants, the teachers, and even the diplomats. Trade deals with Britain and France were cancelled, and any European left after the banishment had their heads chopped off and stuck on pikes along the beach as a warning to foreign invaders. The Mad Queen went on to ban the teachings of Christianity, going so far as to torture and execute anyone who was caught worshipping Jesus or the Christian God. 
It's believed that between 1837 and 1856, she executed about a hundred Christians. She also replaced trial by jury with trial by ordeal, bringing back a barbaric practice from the Dark Ages. A person was made to eat three chicken skins and then drink poison juice. They would then bath, and their innocence was based on whether the chicken skins came back up. If they didn't, that person was deemed guilty. Ranavalona died of old age on August 16, 1861. She was 79 years old and had reduced the Madagascar population from 5 million to about 2.5 million. La Quintrala Catalina de los Rios y Lisberger, aka La Quintrala, was a Chilean aristocrat and landowner born in 1604. She was famous for her beauty and her flaming red hair, as well as her cruel treatment of her servant. Her legacy survives in Chile today as the epitome of wickedness and evil. La Quintrala allegedly practiced witchcraft. It was claimed that she murdered her own father using poison at the age of 18. And in 1624, she murdered a rich vassal from Santiago after luring him to her home with promises of intimate contact. She blamed the murder on a slave who was then subsequently executed. Her favorite thing to do was kill her lovers. She murdered a man named Enrique Enriquez de Guzman, severed the left ear of another lover named Martin, and murdered a knight of Santiago after a passionate night of romance. An official investigation began because so many complaints had been brought up against Catalina. She was accused of 40 murders, but because of her insane wealth and status, the trial was postponed, stalled indefinitely, and she was released. She became a widow in 1654. Another investigation started in 1662, but she died in 1665 of poor health before she could ever be brought to justice. Would you rather accidentally stumble upon a cult performing a ritual in the middle of the woods or witness an exorcism of a close friend? Let us know in the comments below. And while you're at it, hit that subscribe button. Lu Pengli Lu Pengli was the nephew of Emperor Jing of China's Han Dynasty over 2,000 years ago, in 144 BC. He had four brothers, and each of them ruled a small province within the kingdom. Lu Pengli was arguably the worst provincial ruler of them all. He was described as arrogant and cruel, and would frequently go on expeditions to murder people and steal their stuff just for fun. He was a terrorizer, an early serial killer who inspired such fear in the townsfolk that nobody would leave their house at night because they were afraid of being murdered. In the beginning, his status as the nephew of the emperor kept him from any kind of punishment. But his killings grew so barbaric and overzealous that the emperor was forced into a position where he had to do something. He couldn't bear to execute his nephew, but he could banish him. In 116 BC, after three decades of ruthless murdering, Lu Pengli had his titles taken away and was reduced to a commoner. He was then banished to the countryside. We don't actually know what happened after that, as all historical records of Lu Pengli vanished after his banishment. But many historians believe he never stopped murdering. He just got sneakier about it. The Witch of Kilkenny Alice Keitler was the Witch of Kilkenny. She was born to very wealthy parents in Ireland in 1263. She married a man named William Outlaw, a local banker, and they had a son together. Shortly after, William became ill and died suddenly. After his death, she married another wealthy man named Adam de Blund, and lo and behold, he too died abruptly and mysteriously. Now significantly wealthier, Alice married a third man by the name of Richard de Val, and yes, he died under dubious circumstances. It would be Alice's fourth husband who finally unraveled Alice's murder spree. They had been married for a few years, when suddenly her new husband John showed signs of illness. Just before he died, he changed his will so that all of his stuff would go to his young wife, Alice. But John's family wouldn't allow this to happen quietly. They immediately brought charges of witchcraft against Alice, saying she had bewitched John into leaving behind his fortune and then she killed him. She was accused of leading a coven of witches and lying with a demon called Artisan. As Alice was waiting in the dungeons of Kilkenny Castle to be burned at the stake, after being found guilty of witchcraft, she escaped, and after her escape, we have no idea what happened to her. Chrisman Jennifer Tenga Chrisman Jennifer Tenga was one of the most prolific serial killers in German history, 
and one who may not have even existed. The story goes back to the 1570s when Chrisman allegedly set up a base deep in a cave somewhere in the forests of the Rhineland. Oddly enough, this was the same spot that Hitler set up camp almost 400 years later. Chrisman gathered a gang of robbers and began killing and pillaging across Germany and France. Legend has it he would kill any travelers he found wandering in the woods and sometimes even murder his own comrades in a fit of bloody rage. Legend states that Chrisman kept a journal documenting his 13 years of crime, and in this journal he detailed every single death he was responsible for. By the time he was captured, he had 964 murders logged in his book, and admitted he had been trying to hit the goal of a thousand. By far the most disturbing part of his story involves a woman he took hostage. He held this hostage in his cave lair for an unknown number of years. She gave birth to several of his kids, which he then promptly cooked and ate. Although there are plenty of stories of Chrisman's murder spree, historians say there isn't actually any evidence to back them up. Some believe his story may have started as partially true, a murderer lurking in the woods, but was embellished over the centuries. Catherine Montvoisin Catherine Montvoisin, also known as La Voisin, was a fortune teller in France in the 17th century. She provided everything from poisons to aphrodisiacs, pregnancy termination drugs, and she even organized black masses and other paranormal events. She was the head witch, the top sorceress who was allegedly behind the killings of at least 1,000 people, but perhaps even 2,500. Catherine was deadlier in her short 40 years on this planet than the Italian Mafia. Business was booming up until the death of King Louis XIV's sister-in-law, the Duchess d'Orléans, by supposed poisoning in 1670. It was around that same time when business started to spiral. There were riots and people were accusing witches of abducting children. Plus, priests were receiving way too many confessions about people poisoning their loved ones and regretting it. All of these accusations led directly to Catherine Montvoisin. Fortune tellers began to be arrested in 1677, followed by a string of poisoners and sorceresses in 1679, and on March 12th of that year, Catherine was arrested outside Notre Dame de Bonne Nouvelle. She was put on trial on February 17, 1680. The court convicted her of witchcraft, she was tortured mercilessly for two full days, and then was burned at the stake on the Place de Grève in Paris on February 22nd. Thomas Griffiths Wainwright Thomas Wainwright was an English aristocrat born in October of 1794. He was an artist, author, and almost definitely a serial killer. He gained a reputation as being what they called a dandy back then, meaning a man who placed great importance upon things like leisurely hobbies and their own appearance. He was transported to a penal colony in Australia for defrauding the Bank of England in 1837. His murder spree happened before he committed fraud. It's believed that Thomas poisoned his sister-in-law so that he could collect a life insurance policy which he had recently taken out on her. It's also believed that he killed his uncle, his mother-in-law, and one of his best friends. Following the four killings he allegedly committed, Thomas fled to France, but he eventually got bored and returned to Britain, at which point he was promptly arrested. But since the prosecution lacked any kind of evidence for the murders, they simply came up with the forgery charge and shipped him to Tasmania. It was all they could do to be rid of him. Thomas stayed in the penal colony until he died of natural causes in 1847. To this day, we still don't know if he really did kill all those people. However, there are rumors that he carried strychnine on him, a strong odorless poison, in case he needed to do a quick and discreet murder. The Acid Bath Murderer George Hay was the Acid Bath Murderer. When his warehouse in West Sussex was raided by the English police in 1949, they discovered 40-gallon drums along with multiple containers of concentrated sulfuric acid, and that wasn't all they found on his property. He also had 28 pounds melted human body fat, all of which he had collected from his horrifying acid baths. George didn't have a great life right from the start. When he was only 25, he was sent to jail and did two years for fraud. When he was released from prison, he moved from the countryside to London and became a chauffeur. But he continued to swindle people and was arrested and imprisoned again for four years in 1939. When he got out the second time, he had a plan to get rich through swindling and murdering. 
His first victim was William McSwan, a local slumlord. George lured William into a basement, hit him over the head, and then dumped him in a drum of sulfuric acid. When the victim had become nothing more than sludge, George poured his gooey remains down a manhole. He then took over William's duty as landlord and started raking in serious cash. George committed five murders in this fashion before he was caught dissolving his sixth and final victim. His last victim was Olive Duran Deacon, a wealthy widow whom he lured to his warehouse. But the police were already investigating him, and when they searched his warehouse following the murder, they found her gooey remains in a bucket. George hadn't had time to get to a manhole cover and pour her sludge down into the sewer. He was caught and found guilty of murder. He confessed to the murder and to the five others. George always shot his victims first, using the revolver he'd stolen, and then disposing of them in metal drums filled with acid. He was sentenced to death and was executed on August 10, 1949. Carl Denke Carl Denke, also known as the Cannibal of Zipiche, was born in the Kingdom of Prussia to a wealthy family of farmers in the late 1800s. During his childhood, he proved to be a difficult child. He ran away from home and he was always getting into trouble. In his 20s, he moved away for good and began work as a gardener. But somewhere along the line, this ordinary garden worker had something snap inside his head. In 1903, Carl killed a woman named Ida Lorna and allegedly ate the meat off her bones. He went on killing for 21 years, and the truth is that we don't know all the details about his murder spree or his victims. There was Emma Sander in 1909, Heinrich Bruchmann in 1914, and someone named Niebel in 1919. Then his last three killings came in 1924 with Kaspar Hubelek, Rokas Paulik, and lastly, Vincenz Olivier. But those are only his confirmed killings. A notebook was discovered with 31 names written in it, and some experts have guessed he may have murdered upwards of 42 people. He killed indiscriminately, uncaring of gender or social status. All he cared about was the meat. It's believed he was eating most of it and then selling off whatever was left as pork to keep himself financially afloat. The only reason his gruesome spree of terror came to an end was that his last victim, Vincenzo Olivier, escaped and identified him. When the police went to Carl's home, they discovered the belongings of over 12 random people and a pair of drums holding massive chunks of human meat. Steve Wright Steve Wright is a notorious English serial killer who murdered five innocent women in 2006. But he also murdered 17-year-old Victoria Hall in September 1999. He wasn't caught for the murder of Victoria until the Suffolk police reopened the investigation in 2019. Steve is one of the most hated men alive in the United Kingdom. He went on an unbelievable killing spree in the Ipswich area between October 30th and December 10th, 2006. In rapid succession, he murdered Tanya Nichol, Gemma Adams, Anneli Alderton, Paula Clennell, and Annette Nichols, all between the ages of 19 and 29. They were also sex workers, women Steve viewed as easy victims. His killing spree was so horrifying, the town was nearly locked down. People were scared to go out at night until this guy was caught. Thankfully, the police did catch up to him. In 2008, he was convicted of all five murders and given life in prison. Now it looks like he'll be convicted of yet another murder, this one from 22 years ago. The death of Victoria Hall is one of many unsolved murders Steve is linked to. He's also been accused of killing Natalie Pierman in 1992, Amanda Duncan in 1993, Kelly Pratt in 2000, and Michelle Bettles in 2002. Stephanie St. Clair Stephanie St. Clair was the queen of numbers in the 1930s. She dominated the underground scene in Harlem and made millions by running an illegal lottery. She's been called a gangster, a civil rights advocate, and even a savvy businesswoman. Whatever you want to call her, Stephanie was one of the most notorious crime bosses in US history. It was in 1912 that Stephanie moved to New York City from Canada. By the early 1920s, she had started her numbers business in Harlem, setting up a system of illegal lotteries. 
people could bet on specific numbers, then hand those bets over to what they called bankers. The bankers would bring the bets back to headquarters, and then everyone waited for the winning numbers to come in for that day. It was the exact same thing as the lottery, only run illegally by a single woman in Harlem. Stephanie made a personal fortune of over $500,000 very quickly. That equals about $8 million in today's currency. But then in 1938, she was convicted for attempted murder for trying to kill her contract husband, Hamid. After she got out of prison, Stephanie took her fortune and retired in seclusion. She did what almost no other gangster of the 1930s was able to do. She cashed in her chips and got out. Patrick Kearney Patrick Kearney, also known as the Trash Bag Killer, is one of the most terrifying humans who ever lived. He was a serial killer with a disturbing fascination with dead bodies. As a young boy, he slaughtered pigs with his father. He grew up in that sort of carnage and took a liking to it immediately. He was occasionally caught rolling around in the intestines of pigs that he'd slaughtered on his own, just for fun. At school, Patrick was not a popular child. He was bullied and tormented. So, when he left school, he had fantasies about gaining power and punishing those who were mean to him. He joined the Air Force, was discharged, moved to California, and began to hunt. In 1962, Patrick picked up a hitchhiker on his motorcycle. He drove the young man to secluded location, then murdered him and did awful things to his body. Patrick then killed two more people that year before taking a break. He killed again in 1967 in Tijuana. But it was around this time that things got serious between Patrick and a man named David Hill. Being with David seemed to keep Patrick's sick desires at bay, and so he didn't kill again until David left him in 1971. After David left, Patrick went on a brutal killing spree. Police chased after him for nearly six years and finally made the arrest in 1977. Patrick confessed to 35 murders and was given life in prison. He's still alive today at the Mule Creek State Prison, considered one of the most prolific serial killers in U.S. history. Melissa Ann Shepard Melissa Ann Shepard is one of the most notorious criminals in recent Canadian history. She presented herself as a sweet, caring, and deeply affectionate woman to a large number of lonely old men. But Melissa was a black widow, a woman who lured men into thinking they were safe, and then murdered them and stole their money. One of her victims was Alex Strategios, divorced and in his 70s. He was living in Florida when he met Melissa on a dating website, and she flew to Florida to meet him. In 2004, she visited Alex in his home state, and they went for dinner, and then Melissa called 911. Alex randomly passed out and had to be taken to the hospital. He was in such bad shape that Melissa agreed to move into his home and take care of him. But Alex never got better, and nobody could figure out why. Doctors finally did some blood tests and learned that he was being given massive amounts of benzodiazepines. Melissa was drugging his ice cream and also stealing his money. By the time anyone figured out what was happening, she had already stolen $18,000 from the man. This was not Melissa's first incident with fraud and attempted murder. She ran over and killed her husband Stuart in 1991 and claimed it was an accident. She also murdered her next husband Dennis Friedrich in 2002. Luckily, the family caught Melissa before she could kill Alex and she was given four years in jail. She was 74 years old when she got out in 2009 and was promptly deported back to Canada. Shortly after, she was arrested by the Canadian police for poisoning Fred Weeks, whom she had just gotten married to. She spent almost three years in prison and was paroled in 2016. Her release came with conditions. She wasn't allowed to date or use the internet. But just months after getting out, she was allegedly found at the library in Halifax trying to find a date on the internet. 80-year-old Melissa was arrested and charged with breaking the terms of her release on April 11, 2016. The charges were eventually dropped. The allegations of her drugging Alex Strategos and Robert Friedrich were never proven. Melissa Ann Shepard is currently a free woman living in Nova Scotia. Do you think Melissa Ann Shepard should be free right now? Tell me what you think in the comments below. The Grimsby Hangman Harry Kirk was the Grimsby Hangman, the notorious executioner whose job was to carry out death sentences. 
He was the one who executed the acid bath murderer George Hay in 1949 and many others. He was even behind the botched execution of Norman Goldthorpe. Norman, 40 years old and divorced, was convicted of strangling a senior citizen who also happened to work as a prostitute. Norman was thrown into a fit of anger after one of his lovers walked out on him, and he deliberately went in search of a helpless woman to take out his anger on. At approximately 8 o'clock in the morning, on November 24, 1950, Norman was due to die for his crime. Harry Kirk opened his cell door, tied his hands with a leather strap, and dragged him to the gallows. Once there, a hood was draped over Norman's face, and the noose was tied around his neck. Harry pulled the lever to open the trap door, and Harry should have fallen and snapped his neck. Instead, he struggled and gargled in horrible agony. Harry the Executioner had botched the killing. He had pulled the hood too far down over Norman's neck, fouling the noose and preventing a clean death. For several minutes, Norman struggled. He did finally die, but it was horrific. This was Harry's final execution. Even though Harry isn't seen in history's eyes as a murderer, he was the one who put over 40 condemned men and women to death. Charles Bronson Charles Bronson is the most notorious prisoner in the history of the United Kingdom. He's so famous that even Tom Hardy played him in a movie that came out in 2008. Charles has been described as the most violent prisoner in Britain. His life of crime started around the age of 13 when he fell in with a gang of juvenile robbers. He got into fights, he missed school, and he dabbled in petty crime. He was convicted of armed robbery in 1974 when he was only 22 years old and was sentenced to seven years in prison. But he didn't get out until 1987. Time continued to be added on to his sentence for fighting and attacking prison officers. His brief time out of jail was spent as a bare-knuckle boxer in London, but he only lasted until 1988 when he was given seven years yet again for another robbery. He was let out in 1992, spent 50 days free, then was arrested yet again for conspiracy to rob. This time he was given eight years. Everything went really sour in 1999 when Charles took the prison teacher Phil Danielson prisoner and held him hostage for 44 hours. This earned Charles a life sentence and cemented his place as the most notorious prisoner in Britain. He's still there right now, incarcerated at HM Prison, Woodhill. Arnold Rothstein Arnold Rothstein was a notorious criminal in the era of prohibition. He was one of the first kingpins of crime that America ever saw, and one of the first big business criminals to never be prosecuted by the law. Arnold started out with small-time stuff, acting as a loan shark and making money through gambling. He eventually climbed the ladder and became a fixer, someone who kept the peace between the criminals and the police. He also became a legendary gambler who supposedly rigged most of the games he bet on. That way, he always won. Whatever the case, he made a huge amount of cash through gambling and fixing games. Arnold's gambling ultimately gave him enough capital to invest in racetracks, to open his own casino in Manhattan, and to become a millionaire at 30 years old. But Arnold Rothstein truly became an infamous criminal when he fixed the 1919 World Series. He was behind bribing White Sox players to take dives, thereby throwing the game so that the Cincinnati Reds won. Arnold cleaned up, making over $350,000 on the game. Then, when Prohibition began the year after, he immediately started making big bucks in the booze business. But in the end, Arnold was just doing too much. He was dealing narcotics, alcohol, fixing games, and was massively wealthy. But he had too many enemies. He walked into a poker game at the Park Central Hotel in Manhattan and was shot to death on November 6, 1928. We still don't know who killed him. Belle Star Belle Star was not only notorious, she was infamous. She was a frightening outlaw and maniac criminal in the days of the Wild West, in the second half of the 1800s as the US expanded into the West. Her real name was Myra May Belle Shirley, but she took the name Belle Star after marrying Sam Star in 1880. He was part of the Star Gang and a native Cherokee. They lived on Cherokee land together, consorted with criminals like Jesse James, and participated in the usual crimes of the Wild West, mostly stealing horses and shooting pistols. 
Bell was arrested once for stealing horses and spent nine months in a Detroit jail. Immediately after her release, she returned to Cherokee territory and began thieving again. She was arrested twice. Her criminal husband Sam was shot down in 1886, and Bell moved in with another man named Bill July. But in 1889, just before her 41st birthday, Bell was shot to death by an unknown individual. She had cultivated quite a few enemies over the years, including her own son and daughter, and to this day, nobody knows who hunted her down like an assassin. Sawney Bean Sawney Bean is the most famous cannibal in Scottish history. We don't know much about his early life, but experts believe he was born in East Lothian in the late 15th century. He relocated to Ayrshire, married a woman, and set up his home inside of the Benain Cave. To support his new wife and growing family, he took to a life of robbery. He ambushed travelers on narrow roadways, stole their belongings, and murdered them so that he couldn't be identified. But somewhere along the way, Sawney Bean truly lost his mind. Not only was he killing his victims, but he was also bringing them back to his cave and eating them. He was sustaining himself, his wife, and their family on a rich diet of human flesh. It's been reported that Sawney Bean had at least 14 babies with his wife, and he fed each of them human meat. Then, as the years went on, Sawney continued to breed and have more babies with his own children, raising new generations of cave-dwelling cannibals. For over 20 years, Sawney Bean and his inbred family killed and ate humans. Local authorities were slow to act, but did eventually get suspicious when they started finding decayed human body parts showing up on all the beaches. The cannibal became such a big problem that King James I came to town with an army of 400 men and tracked down their hideout. The entire family, all 48 of them, were arrested, and the men were sentenced to death. The Axemen of New Orleans For 18 months in 1918, the city of New Orleans was plagued by a horrible serial killer who would come to be known only as the Axeman. He was responsible for 12 attacks that resulted in six deaths. In terrifying fashion, the Axemen specifically attacked people who were sleeping in their beds. He would break into a house, find himself a weapon, usually an axe, and then murder the homeowners as they slept. These poor people would wake up being bludgeoned by a psychopath. He would then leave his weapon at the scene of the crime and vanish into the night. The first attack occurred on May 23, 1918. The Axeman broke into a house at 4901 Magnolia Street and attacked Catherine and Joseph Maggio using an axe and a straight razor. Nothing was stolen, the murderer likely didn't know his victims. It was an act of indiscriminate brutality. After months and months of carnage, the Times-Picayune newspaper received a letter from the alleged killer. The Axeman claimed to be a demon, an evil spirit risen from hell. He also threatened the police, saying they were too stupid to catch him because he was protected by Satan himself. Unfortunately for New Orleans, the police did indeed fail to capture him or even identify him. The final attack occurred on October 27, 1919. Mike Peppertone was struck in the head by an axe in his own home, right in front of his wife. His wife woke up just in time to see the killer fleeing the scene and her husband dead on the ground. After that, the axeman retired. Kate Webster Kate Webster was an Irish maid in Victorian London. She carried out one of the most savage murders of the 19th century when she dismembered her employer, a woman named Julia Martha Thomas. But let's start at the beginning. Kate Webster was born in County Wexford in 1849. She took to a life of thievery as a youngster, was imprisoned at the age of 15, and moved to Liverpool in 1867. She continued her criminal career there, was given four years for larceny in 1868, and was released in 1872. She then moved on to London, where she got a job as a maid. Her main objective was to rob her employers blind, and then flee to a new job. She was caught doing this and went to jail again in 1875 and 1877. In 1879, Kate Webster was employed as a domestic servant to Julia Thomas in Richmond. 
She proved to be a really poor domestic servant, so she was fired. Kate was so angry that she never got to steal anything before getting fired that she threw her employer down the stairs, sawed her head off with a razor, sliced the rest of her body into pieces, burned whatever she could, and threw the rest into the river. But the real horror is that, according to Detective Inspector David Bolton, who recently re-examined the case in the 21st century, Kate Webster cooked a few pieces of her former employer. She then fed them to a couple of street boys because she thought it was funny. On July 29, 1879, Kate Webster was hanged. She was the only woman hanged at the Wandsworth prison out of 135 other criminals sentenced to death. The Thames Torso Murders The Thames Torso Murders took place between 1887 and 1889. None of the murders were solved, and only four victims were ever identified. The only reason the authorities knew they were dealing with a serial killer was because the body parts had all been surgically operated on. A woman's skull was discovered alongside the river, then a woman's arm in a parcel. A human torso was found later, as well as other pieces of the victims. Somebody had surgically cut two victims into pieces, expertly separating the limbs from the torsos. No one ever found out who did it, and three years later the same thing happened again. Workers along the river found a bundle with the torso of a female in it, and then through that spring, more body parts washed up along the river. Each body part had been surgically removed, just like the victims three years prior. The murderer had struck again. Finally, the dismembered remains of yet another woman were found at three different sites across the city between September and October of 1888. Yet again, the limbs had all been removed from the torso with surgical precision. There were four bodies in total, and nobody has any clue who was responsible. Do you think it could have been a local doctor responsible for the murders? Tell us what you think in the comments below, and hit that subscribe button while you're at it. Red Barn Murder Maria Martin was born in the village of Polstead in 1801. She was an attractive young woman who found herself being courted by many of the town's young men. In May of 1827, she was persuaded to meet a man named William Corder at the Red Barn, a local landmark in the small English town. They were supposed to run away to Ipswich, where they would elope and live happily ever after. They did indeed meet at the Red Barn, but they never married, and Maria was never seen alive again. Following the arranged meeting in 1827, both Maria and William were gone. However, William remained in touch with Maria's family. He sent letters frequently, explaining that they were both in good health and that they were living joyfully on the Isle of Wight. A year later, something paranormal happened. Maria's stepmother began having dreams that Maria had been murdered. These dreams were persistent and convincing enough that she persuaded Maria's father to start poking around. Either by coincidence or divine intervention, Maria's father investigated the Red Barn and found Maria's skeletal remains hiding inside of a grain storage bin. She had been strangled and shot in the head, as well as stabbed multiple times with a sword. William was tracked down shockingly quickly for the early 19th century. He was arrested where he had taken up residence at a private school for girls in London. When he was finally brought to court, the jury took less than 30 minutes to find him guilty. The judge sentenced him to be hanged within the week. The Pimlico Poisoning On January 1, 1886, Adelaide Bartlett woke up to find her husband Thomas lying dead on the floor. Thomas had been sick for quite some time, first falling ill in December of 1885, about a month earlier. The local doctor had come to their home in Pimlico, London, but there was nothing he could do to help the exhausted Mr. Bartlett. His illness was blamed on a mishap at the dentist ten years earlier. His teeth had rotted and looked to be slowly poisoning him. At first, his death was attributed to an infection caused by his rotting teeth. But when an autopsy was performed, things got a little mysterious. Doctors discovered a lethal dose of chloroform inside his stomach. Somebody had poisoned Thomas, but no one could figure out how. The issue with chloroform is that it's a caustic substance and will burn tissue it comes into contact with. Because Thomas had no chemical burns in his throat, doctors couldn't figure out how the poison had made its way into his stomach. 
It was revealed that Thomas's wife and the local minister, George Dyson, had secretly been working together. Adelaide and Thomas were in a loveless marriage, and Thomas had promised the minister that if he were to die, he could have his wife. When the case went to trial, nobody was found guilty of murder. George and Adelaide were both acquitted, mostly because nobody could figure out how either of them had poisoned Thomas. It was clear this was some kind of strange love triangle situation, but the court couldn't prove it beyond a doubt. To this day, we still don't know who poisoned Thomas, or how they got the poison into his system. The Mayflower Killer The Plymouth Colony had been in America for about 10 years when disaster struck. These pilgrims had traveled across the Atlantic Ocean on the Mayflower in September of 1620, and were some of the very first people from Europe to build a life for themselves in the New World. But even in the New World, they found themselves dealing with a murderer. John Billington was one of the first 41 pilgrims, but he didn't make history for what he did as a settler, but rather for what he did in 1630 when he shot and killed another colonist. John was a problem from the very beginning. He was like the bad kid in class. He was the first person to commit a crime in America in 1621 when he refused to obey the orders of the military. He kept getting into disputes, he was trying to undermine the colony, and he was just generally troublesome. Then, in 1630, he shot and killed John Newcomen. The two had been arguing for quite some time, and their differences erupted in violence. John Billington became the first to murder another settler in Plymouth Colony, and he was subsequently found guilty of murder and hanged. The Velisca Axe Murders 110 years since the brutal Velisca Axe Murders, the crime still goes unsolved. It happened on June 10, 1912. The bodies of Josiah and Sarah Moore, their four kids and two visiting local girls who had been hanging out with their children, were all found dead in their beds in the town of Velisca, just 100 miles from Des Moines in Iowa. The children were Herman Moore, 11 years old, Catherine Moore, 10 years old, Boyd Moore, 7, Paul Moore, 5, then Lena Stillinger, and Ina Stillinger, 12 and 8. Each one had been killed with an axe that was taken from the family's backyard. It happened while they were sleeping at around midnight. Before the killings, the family had spent the night at the local church and got home a little late at around 10 o'clock. Just two hours later, they were all dead. The murder is particularly bizarre because no one heard any cries coming from the house. The neighbors didn't detect a raucous, and none of the victims appeared to hear anyone else in the house being killed. You would imagine that at some point in the massacre, someone would have woken up and ran, but each one of them were killed in bed, totally oblivious to what was happening. Approximately 110 years later, Iowa's most chilling murder is still unsolved. Medieval Killers While a group of restorers were doing some work inside the Cathedral of the Transfiguration of the Savior in Russia, they came across a mysterious inscription on one of the walls. The inscription contained a list of 20 medieval murderers. It may just be helping to shed some new light on one of the greatest murder mysteries of Russia in the 12th century. The inscription mentions Andrei Bogolyovsky, the Grand Prince of Vladimir Suzdal in 1174 AD. He was one of the most powerful princes of Europe, and he was murdered. The inscription says that the prince was killed by his servants, while the list of murderers mentions each person who was involved by name. Three of the individuals on the list were already known by historians for being involved in the legendary assassination, but the other names were previously unknown. Andrei Bogolyovsky ruled over a major principality in Rus and was primarily responsible for the decline of Kiev's grip over the northern lands. As he reduced the power of the upper nobility, they began to plot against him. On the night of June 28, 1174, 20 men burst into his bedchamber and stabbed him to death. One of the killers was his wife's brother, Yakim Kichka. And while historians already knew his name, as well as the names of Petr Fralovich and Ambal, nobody ever knew the identities of the other 17 killers. Until now. Edgar Allan Poe and Mary Rogers Mary Rogers turned up dead in the Hudson River in 1838. Mary was a teenager, the beautiful daughter of a boarding house keeper who worked as a clerk at John Anderson's Liberty Street cigar shop. She sold tobacco to some of the most prominent writers of the day, men like James Fenimore Cooper and Washington Irving. On July 25th, Mary went out and never returned home. 
It was stormy out, and so her mother assumed she had gotten held up by bad weather. But by the next night, when Mary still hadn't returned, people began to worry, and on July 28th, her corpse was found floating in the river. The coroner did an autopsy and determined Mary had been beaten to death. The main suspect was her fiancé, Daniel Payne. There were allegations that Mary had been thinking about breaking off the marriage and that Daniel had killed her in a fit of rage. But Daniel had an airtight alibi, so it couldn't have been him. Some believed Mary had been killed by criminals, a robbery gone wrong. Then it came out that she'd been seen in the company of a tall, dark stranger on the evening she went missing. But nobody could ever figure out the identity of this mysterious stranger. Even Edgar Allan Poe in 1842 tried to solve the case, but came up empty, instead resorting to memorializing Mary's mysterious death in the mystery of Marie Roget. Which of these true crime tales disturbed you the most? Let me know in the comments, and thanks for watching. Remember to hit subscribe if you haven't yet, and come back soon for more unbelievable videos.